Good evening, everybody. My name is Roger Kirby. I'm president of the Royal Society of Medicine, and it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you the Jeffcott Lecturer for this year. You'll be hearing more about uh, the Jeffcott family from Sir David Jeffcott, who will give the vote of thanks at the end, but this is actually the 42nd Jeffcott Lecture, and I'm pleased to say that we've got 450 people signed up for it, which is an indication of just how famous uh, our speaker is tonight. So Professor Peter Carroll Piot, uh, KCMG, was born uh, in 1949 and he's a Belgian microbiologist known for his research into Ebola and to AIDS. Peter's a director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. After helping discover the Ebola virus in 1976 and then leading efforts to contain the first ever recorded Ebola epidemic in the very same year, Peter became a pioneer and a researcher into AIDS. He's held key positions in the United Nations and the World Health Organization involving AIDS research and management. He's also served as a professor at several universities worldwide. He's the author of 16 books and over 600 scientific uh, publications. So Peter, uh, please, we'd love to hear your lecture entitled The Age of Pandemics. Uh, and indeed, we're living in an age of pandemic, so we could not have a more appropriate title. Over to you, Peter, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, and uh, hello, everybody, where you may be. Uh, also, uh, thank you, Sir David, for, uh, you know, for being with us, and I I'm very honoured to uh, give this lecture in honour of Sir Harry uh, Jeffcott, and um, really remarkable person, because he was... Uh, as familiar and as at ease with chemistry and uh, business and, um, you know, and law and philanthropy. So it's a, something, it's the kind of people we need also to, to tackle uh, pandemics. And uh, um, so this is uh, for me a great honor. And uh, um, it's also a coincidence, but uh, about a year ago in a few days, I developed fever a splitting headache, um, uh, you know, hyperesthesia of my skull, uh, diarrhea, and uh, and I was completely exhausted suddenly, and uh, and that was the beginning of um, my own encounter with um, with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2, as the virus is now called, and uh, it was ironic I felt because after having tried to fight viruses my whole professional life. Uh, a virus got me. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Um, yeah, but my um, relationship with viruses really started in 1976, so quite a while ago, uh, when I had just graduated from, uh, from medical school and I was in training in infectious diseases and also um, clinical microbiology and um, was at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp in Belgium. And um, really by coincidence we isolated a virus that would be called um, Ebola. Uh, here's a publication in the Lancet of, that was in 1977 then. Um, you know we called it Marburg-like virus um, and because that was how it looked like and uh, it was at the U.S. Center for Disease Control uh, where they had a special pathogen lab just as uh, Horton Down uh, had one. There were only four in, in these days in the whole world. Three were military labs. Porton Down was a military one, also uh, one in, in the Soviet Union, one and two in the US, and one was, a, uh, you know, the Centers for Disease Control. They could demonstrate it was a, a new virus. And you see here on the right, upper right side, uh, Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, who was the uh, Congolese um, physician microbiologist, who was the first one to to see the patients and to, to draw samples. Um, and the virus is called after the Ebola River, a rare picture of that river, which is in the center of the equatorial forest near the uh, epicenter of the first outbreak. So this is how it started. I, um, uh, you know, I'd never been to Africa and I'd never investigated an epidemic, but here we went and uh, because there were not many um, people who were um, volunteers to go, and this, this was for me the, uh, the opportunity and how I got into both um, global health and um, 
you know, and also um, epidemics and viruses. Next slide, please. And um, since then, uh, there have been um, something like uh, 15 uh, outbreaks of uh, Ebola uh, epidemics, but increasingly. And the dogma was for many years that this was limited to Central Africa. Most outbreaks were in what's now called the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. When I went there for the first time, it was called Zaire and uh, surrounding countries. And, uh, and everything changed in 2014 when the largest ever Ebola outbreak uh, ever yeah, um, occurred in West Africa um, and in three countries, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea Conakry, um, where it really paralyzed life for well over a year and caused 11,000 deaths. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, fortunately, Ebola virus is not transmitted uh, uh, respiratory uh, ways, but um, through close contact. But the mortality rate, the case fatality rate uh, in the first outbreak in, uh, in a place called Yambuku, where I worked then, was 90%, 90. And uh, in uh, Sierra Leone, it was first 60% and then 35%. So far more lethal than uh, the coronaviruses or than the one that we have at the moment. Um, and not as easy as uh, transmittable. Um, in the meantime, um, there have been many outbreaks. And at this very moment, there are two outbreaks going on. One in uh, Guinea, West Africa, um, and one again in, in, in Eastern Congo. Uh, and it's not impossible that the outbreaks have been um, triggered by someone who is a survivor of uh, Ebola virus infection and has been asymptomatically infected for quite a while and then through probably sexual transmission infected others and this triggered again uh, an outbreak. I'm mentioning that because this is how, you know, it, uh, Ebola is, uh, makes headline news and uh, it's very frightening. It's a hemorrhagic fever. Um, uh, it's very dramatic, but basically one week after infection, you come down with a disease and one week later, um, about yeah, over half of the people are dead. And from a perspective of a virus, um, that's not very efficient because a virus can't survive without a host, a living host, be it living cells, be it a plant, an animal or us, you know, human primates. Um, and so then it has to look for another one. Can I have the next slide? And so this was my entry in the world of uh, uh, epidemics, but it is actually more of an, uh, a very scary, but an outlier. Um, now, epidemics and uh, infectious diseases have been with us as a human species basically throughout history. It's part of the human condition. However, it's probably since we became sedentary, since we became, you know, communities and uh, started agriculture, the first cities were, um, you know, founded that um, infectious diseases had a really very fertile breeding ground for, um, you know, for spreading, for infecting people. And uh, this is a very incomplete list of uh, uh, epidemics in, in history um, from an article by Morens and Tony Fauci uh, in Cell last year. And you know, the plague of Athens, uh, 100,000 deaths, but uh, you know, a, a plague in the sixth century that killed 30 to 50 million people, the Black Death. And, uh, you know, we can still see that in the Museum of London, um, you know, killed about 50 million people. Uh, and that's at a time when the total world population was more, we should be counted in hundreds of millions and not in billions of people. Um, so, and then the last big ones that we've had were, of course, the Spanish flu about 100 years ago, which killed more people than the whole of World War I. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, in modern times, it's uh, HIV uh, as a new, um, you know, a totally new virus that in the meantime has killed about 37 million people, um, but that's become like endemic. Can I have a next slide? And then there have been all the time new viruses. Again, I won't go over all the, um, you know, the um, epidemics and, and the microorganisms that are on this world map. But this is a um, worldwide phenomenon. It's uh, sometimes we may think here that all uh, oh, this comes from Africa or from China. No, there are um, 
outbreaks, epidemics that are coming from, um, you know, from any con continent actually. Um, but there are um, re-emerging ones. Uh, I mean, even the plague, good old plague, um, regularly, uh, uh, you know, causes outbreaks in a country like Madagascar, but also in some parts of the US like Arizona uh, or in Congo um, and then, or India. And then we've got new viruses. Uh, some are genuinely new and for humans and others are because we, we hadn't discovered them before. Or take the Zika virus, which was discovered in, um, in Uganda, in the Zika forest actually by the MRC unit where, where, the, where the, um, the Uganda Virus Research Institute in 1947. Um, but it was a coincidental uh, uh, discovery when they were looking for the virus reservoir of yellow fever. And it was for many years a virus without um, a disease. Until a few years ago in Brazil, there was a major outbreak and that led to um, very tragic uh, problems in terms of um, congenital uh, infections leading to um, microcephaly and various neurological sequelae in, um, in infants and newborns uh, born to uh, mothers who were infected with Zika during pregnancy. HIV, clearly a new virus. And then we've got some man-made problems. I mean, and I think a few years ago, Sally Davis gave the Jeff Gott lecture on antimicrobial resistance, and that is clearly man-made. Um, and I think we should put also under the, the epidemics. And the, the number of outbreaks is increasing and of um, large epidemics. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? Um, no, and there are some reasons for that. I mean, um, and it's a combination of factors. Um, it's, uh, of course, we are um, what used to be a, a, a local problem today in no time can become a global one. And that's because we're so much more mobile, or at least we used to be. Uh, when you look at international travel, um, for whatever reasons, or population migrations, like when there's conflict, um, and that means like take SARS in 2003, started in um, Eastern China, Hong Kong, outbreak there. Someone flies from Hong Kong to Toronto in Canada and uh, caused an outbreak there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, certainly uh, a factor that uh, promotes the spread of uh, infections and of viruses. We've got also the, the population pressure. Uh, like 100 years ago, during the Spanish flu, the world population was, I think, 1.7 billion people, killing 50 million. Uh, today, uh, we are like 7.9 billion people. Um, and so the population pressure is there and that uh, in through um, massive urbanization, but also um, pressure on nature, deforestation, uh, more intense interaction between people and um, wild animals, but also the, the food chain, um, food demand, um, all that uh, makes us extremely vulnerable. And then there's a continuing um, poverty, which uh, these it's usually poor people who are the most affected, um, and um, climate change. Can I have the next slide? Uh, climate change, which is one of the other big issues in our time. Now, what do all the various um, uh, viruses and epidemics have in common that, when you, that you saw on the world map. They are nearly all zoonosis. Zoonosis is a, uh, an infection of uh, us humans, um, which originates in, um, in other animals and where they often uh, thrive and multiply without any problems, although they can also cause um, disease in, uh, in other animals. Um, and when you look here, at chimpanzee, this, uh, this is HIV, this, uh, comes from chimpanzees. We have bats are a very, very uh, fertile ground and uh, reservoir for viruses and certainly for coronaviruses. And then, of course, when we have our seasonal um, influenza outbreaks, um, these are viruses that um, nearly always originate from an animal. Uh, often it's... Um, now birds and poultry, uh, but it can be pigs also. 
And uh, what happens in these uh, animals reservoirs are um, often it's just not mutations, but recombinations, genetic recombinants that are being produced. And then we have a, um, you know, infection all the time probably of humans. And now and then the virus takes and can multiply in the humans um, and then can be transmitted. So there are a number of, uh, uh, you know, conditions that have to, uh, to happen to be present in order to uh, make that uh, cross species jump um, productive. Um, and, uh, and there are also direct contaminations like uh, famous food markets. Uh, uh, you see here these pictures I took in, 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 in Congo where you know, bats and, uh, and monkeys are part of the diet. Um, but it's particularly now um, bats. And I, I've become fascinated by bats because they harbor many viruses from Ebola virus, Marburg virus, um, rabies uh, can be uh, the, some bats, uh, but also now we know coronaviruses. And, um, and in, in one um, cave, uh, there's now a famous cave where in China, uh, they found bats that were infected with a whole uh, gene pool of uh, uh, SARS-related coronaviruses. And that's probably origin, the origin of our current problem. Next slide, please. Um, that means also that when we think of uh, early detection of surveillance for uh, infectious diseases and potential emerging pathogens, that we should not limit ourselves to what's going on in, um, in humans, but also uh, closely link with, um, you know, with surveillance of, of uh, known and unknown uh, pathogens in, the, in, in, in humans. And, uh, and because that can uh, be an advanced warning. And that system is now functioning quite well for influenza viruses. We know when uh, a, a new type um, of influenza virus is detected in um, either wild birds or in, um, in poultry or pigs or so, and, uh, and then the, the red lights start flickering and say, okay, this can be uh, the first stage of uh, infection in an epidemic in uh, in humans. Next slide, please. Um, now, as I mentioned climate change and um, the most obvious uh, impact of climate change on, um, on health is that uh, vector-borne diseases will um, be uh, more prevalent. And here we've got a whole uh, set of viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes that um, and can only thrive uh, under certain uh, conditions of temperature and sun, both for the mosquito to multiply and to reproduce and for the viruses to multiply. Um, but there are, of course, far bigger uh, impacts of health of, uh, and climate change on health, um, many actually through uh, food production uh, and, uh, of course, through extreme temperatures. Can I have the next slide? But just take... Um, four um, viruses that are of concern. Uh, I mentioned Zika, this dengue, huge uh, problem in many parts of the world, chikungunya uh, causing another arbovirus, uh, causing epidemics, and yet, uh, good old yellow fever against which we are, can be vaccinated. And by the way, for, um, for travel to certain countries, um, we, you know, a vaccine certificate for yellow fever is requested. So all the discussion about the vaccine certificate is certainly not new. Um, but what's happening is that um, we traditionally, um, these infections would not uh, occur in Europe, except as an import case. But now we've got um, more and more cases, it's still relatively small outbreaks of uh, such infections because the mosquitoes are coming to Europe. The same is true in the in the US, where you see that it's they're moving up north. And even on the Côte d'Azur in France, we had a few years ago some indigenous cases of dengue, chikungunya in Italy, and so on. Next slide. So uh, we're up for for trouble uh, just because of climate change. Um, now let's go now to COVID and where we are. Um, so. 
about it's about a, a year ago that the um, uh, nearly a year ago that uh, uh, the lockdown was declared in in the country um, but the official figures are uh, here on the slide but they don't represent really the the, the reality um, I mean there are close to 120 million confirmed cases globally but um, according to some other estimates and uh, one the first one came out in the economist in september there are probably around 1 billion people who have become infected um, deaths are less underestimated but still uh, you know you can bet it's probably closer to 3 million than uh, than 2.6 million and we see here on the right side um, how uh, the um, the 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 epidemic has been spreading uh, across the world. It's really a pandemic by definition. That means the whole world is there um, and with several waves. We had uh, in the European uh, season, the spring first wave, then we had the one in the winter. And uh, fortunately here in the UK, we are, um, have a really uh, a genuine decrease in new infections. And thanks to the, um, you know, the lockdown, um, in Europe, uh, that was happening as well. However, we are now seeing, particularly in Italy, in France, in uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, something that starts looking like a third wave and driven by the, um, whatever we call it, the Kent or British variant or the B117 uh, variant. And I'll come back to that. Next slide. Um, one of the, um, yeah, here you see for, uh, for Europe, uh, but I'll, I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, some of the, the differences between uh, the spring and the winter uh, in Europe is due to the fact that uh, testing capacity was extremely limited in um, a year ago, I including for myself. You know, I had to go private. I couldn't get tested in the NHS because I didn't meet the case definition. And... Uh, uh, there was very limited uh, ca testing capacity. So that partly explained a, a larger number of cases, but we all know that uh, in terms of hospitalizations and deaths that uh, the, the winter uh, surge and uh, wave has been more deadly than the, the first wave. One uh, uh, issue that uh, I remain puzzled by is what's going on in Africa. I had thought that um, because of dense population in many cities in Africa, poverty, poor health services in many places, that we would see um, a very rapid spread of the, of the virus. This hasn't really happened, even if there's a lot of underreporting. Here you see from Africa Center for Disease Control, which by the way, Africa now has a really genuine, very uh, an excellent um, you know, um, entity uh, dealing with uh, with epidemics, which is new. Uh, five, six years ago, that was not the case. Um, and and uh, uh, what is probably uh, what's happening is that in, in many countries, there's suddenly an, um, a surge, a uh, major spread of the virus, lots of deaths, uh, shortage of oxygen in many places, um, because we talk a lot about ventilator, but if only every single hospital in Africa had... Um, you know, enough oxygen, which is not only important for um, dealing with uh, patients with COVID, but also for many other uh, reasons from neonatal, uh, you know, problems to uh, others uh, in, in adults. Um, but what's uh, uh, of uh, also great concern is that um, variants have also, um, you know, emerged in Africa, in, in, in South Africa. Um, and I'll come back to that because uh, when we have millions of people who are infected but not being uh, treated um, and not being vaccinated, uh, that's again going to be a major source of um, variants, which may cause then huge problems because the uh, uh, you know therapies may not work, uh, vaccines may not be effective. Uh, next one. Um, we think of uh, uh, this as an epidemic that is something acute and indeed most people will either have mild infections or end up in the hospital and have an acute in disease and so on or in the worst case uh, end up in intensive care and die. But 
we are also up for a massive problem of so-called long COVID, long COVID-19. I myself, I it took about six months before I was fully recovered, and I was, I had uh, heart complications and, uh, uh, you know, extreme fatigue, and uh, besides, of course, um, you know, lung action uh, and um, uh, organizational pneumonia and f uh, fibrosis and so on. So. This is uh, something that uh, originally um, we thought that, okay, this is a respiratory uh, infection, so it's the lungs and, you know, and that's it. No, it's a virus that um, impacts about every single organ, the brain, uh, et cetera. So we will, as a health system, as health services, we'll probably have to deal with literally millions of people who are going to suffer from long-term consequences uh, and that includes also young people who, uh, because there's a, it's of course true that the relative risk for developing serious infection, severe disease and, uh, and dying is much higher above a certain age, particularly over 65 and over 70, and then it increases by age. But um, young people can also uh, die and can also develop this long COVID. And I just wanted to mention that because we need to think of the future and this is going to be part of the future post COVID. Um, next one, please. Now, where are we going? Um, always a, a question and, and can we bring this epidemic to an end? Will vaccination solve our problems? Can I have the next slide? And that's gonna, there are many scenarios, but most, um, uh, people who are working in this, most um, public health virologists, etc. We uh, think that uh, this is going to be uh, a matter of several years rather than uh, of uh, a few more months. And um, this is from a, a report from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board in last year, a few months ago, actually. And um, it really um, looked into the direct impact of a, a you know, of COVID, um, of course, but then also the indirect impacts. We know, uh, look at the uh, waiting list in the NHS. And so the indirect impacts are uh, not only of the, uh, because of the saturation of health services, but also of the impact of, of, of lockdowns. Um, people pushed into extreme poverty, uh, food insecurity, education of children, mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera. So deepening social inequalities. And um, one can safely say that epidemics in general, they not only expose um, the uh, inequalities in society, but also they, uh, they deepen them. Can I have the next slide? And the, um, one of the big uh, debates, um, uh, although I hear that a bit less these days, was that we the tension between uh, public health, saving people, let's say, and saving the economy. And uh, uh, which led then to yeah, tensions and it, it's still there. Uh, but I think that um, that uh, question has been uh, answered unambiguously. This is from, uh, from the Financial Times in an article, but there is more data now. And that shows that those countries that have been most successful in bringing down and controlling the epidemic have suffered the least in, in economic terms. And those who have tried to, to save both the economy and, um, you know, and do a bit on, uh, you know, deal with the epidemic, uh, they really have um, really uh, the, have the uh, biggest uh, impact in terms of the, uh, of the economy. And, and this is measured as fall in, in GDP. And, uh, and we are not in a, in a good uh, company there. And, uh, the country. Next slide, please. Um, now, um, our hope is vaccines, obviously. Um, although it's, we should be very clear, thanks to the lockdown, to the um, fairly uh, primitive um, measures from, you know, distancing, social distancing, uh, masks, um, and uh, you know what the, the, the Japanese call the three C's is avoiding close contact crowds and uh, close spaces. And uh, of course, uh, uh, widespread testing and taste. That has been very effective. And it's intriguing to see that in East Asia and Southeast Asia, by applying these measures, 
they have brought, in most cases, in most countries, the epidemic quite under control. Uh, when you know that a, a country like Vietnam, which has a population of, I think, about 100 million, had less than 10 deaths. Um, Singapore, except, except in the, uh, you know, the migrant population. But there, so why could these societies bring an epidemic under control with the same measures as we have and where we failed with 125,000 deaths? Um, and that's a, a question that we have to, to face. Um, and uh, partly, it's, I think it's uh, culture. Culture in the sense that um, the community comes first, whereas we are in very individualistic type of cultures and, and with the extreme in the United States, with the whole, all the debates about even mask wearing. Uh, but, um, but also um, invasion of privacy by the government, which would be much harder to accept in, 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 uh, in Western societies. Um, where um, you know you're like in Korea, um, you know the through GPS your phone movements are being followed, uh, what you do with your credit card and so on, and that's how you can have uh, immediately can control outbreaks and, and identify people who are uh, infected. But it 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 should you know make us think um, how as a societies with our cultures we are not well prepared when there is a collective threat. And I always think, you know, what's what's really more, um, you know, laudable than by protecting yourself, you protect the whole community. For example, by wearing a mask. But that's not how everybody sees it. Now, here we have vaccines, and we clearly need vaccine to end this uh, uh, epidemics um, in one way or another. Um, and traditionally, vaccine development has been a very slow process, very complicated, uh, often taking ten years. Uh, to develop um, between the initial observations in the lab and having the vaccine on the market. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the, um, but now, fortunately, we've been lucky. On the one hand, uh, that um, coronavirus is not something like an HIV virus. HIV was uh, discovered, is isolated in 1983. So nearly 40 years ago, and we still don't have a vaccine. And it's not because of lack of research of lack of uh, investment. No, billions have been invested. But it is inherently extremely difficult because there is no natural immunity uh, in the case of uh, HIV infection. Uh, whereas um, for uh, coronaviruses and for COVID, there is. And so in record time, vaccines have been brought on the market. As we all know, uh, here the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine was the first to be approved by the regulator. And also regulators have been faster than uh, than usual, then we had the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Moderna, um, this country in Europe, uh, the Janssen j, j vaccine also in the US, and then several vaccines in China and, uh, and the Sputnik vaccine. Uh, and the several uh, are in the pipeline. I won't go into details here, but suffice it to say that in addition to the vaccines that we have now, and uh, you can see all the details, the, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine has a so-called COVID-19 vaccine tracker, which is updated on a daily basis. Next slide. Now, um, and of course, the, the evidence comes from trials, phase three trials, but also, uh, and that's uh, good news, real world evidence supports and actually sometimes exceeds the results of uh, uh, the uh, rigorous um, phase three trials, efficacy trials, which is quite uh, unusual because real world effectiveness is often a bit lower than, um, than clinical trial efficacy. And uh, so now the data from, from England, from Scotland, from Israel, Israel, which is the, um, you know, has the most uh, successful or highest coverage of uh, but vaccines and they're using the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine followed by the United Arab Emirates and then the UK. Um, and, and it's a program that's really uh, uh, going very well, um, uh, considering also how the overall response to the epidemic was not a, a great success. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, and vaccine uh, progress has been very unequal. Here you can see, um, in the after the UK and uh, there is Chile and then the, and the US and then in most of Europe, the vaccination is um, 
much less uh, lower coverage. Not to mention the rest of the world. Um, even China, which has uh, developed from the first vaccines, uh, vaccination rates are very low. And then not to mention the low income countries. Can I have the next slide? Um, there is a, um, though, a, uh, the major initiatives are going on to ensure that all those in need in the world, and that means basically everybody, um, will have access to vaccines. This is not only um, a moral uh, obligation uh, uh, from my perspective, um, it's a good thing to do, no, it's more than that. It's so that no country is safe until unless every country is safe. For two reasons. One, um, if the virus continues to circulate and infect people uh, wherever in the world, this will then be a constant continuous threat for importing cases, unless we close the borders forever, like, like New Zealand or like Japan did for a couple of centuries until 1863, until the main Meiji uh, area came up. But that's not doable. Um, uh, but also, if the virus is infecting millions of people, as I mentioned before, it will, um, you know, generate um, mutants, recombinants, so-called variants, which may undermine the effectiveness of existing vaccines. And um, so there's several, uh, uh, you know, initiatives. There's a coalition of, for epidemic preparedness and Innov innovation. I'm a, a founding member of the board, and we had a, we are having a board meeting this week, and that was uh, established after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa about five years ago now, and the reason was that um, there was a need for a coalition um, between the public sector, um, vaccine producers, academia, um, governments, and uh, to uh, develop vaccines against epidemic threats for which there was certainly then no market incentive. And fortunately we have CEPI and CEPI gave already the first grants to develop vaccines against uh, COVID-19 uh, on um, it was the 22nd or 23rd of January. We were in Davos at the World Economic Forum and three um, uh, grants were, um, were signed, including one to Oxford uh, for the development of the, uh, the vaccine that is now uh, on the market. Um, so that's for development of vaccines, but then it has to reach the people. And there are several uh, initiatives. Um, there's the ACT Accelerator, that's Anti-COVAX Tools Accelerator, uh, which was launched by Ursula von der Leyen uh, with the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a rare event together, and uh, a number of heads of state on the 4th of May, and it aims to develop um, vaccines, therapeutics, this with the Wellcome Trust, and uh, the Gates Foundation, and, um, and diagnostics. And that has led to COVAX. COVAX is buying vaccines as a kind of a buyer's club for um, low and middle income countries. And it's CEPI and Gavi, the, the um, Vaccine Alliance and WHO uh, that are uh, running this together with UNICEF. And then the African Union has also made various uh, uh, you know, deals with companies. Uh, there are lots of contracts, but there are not enough vaccines at the moment. And that's a big issue. Next slide. So it's really a big supply problem at the moment. We, Personally, also, I was pleasantly surprised how fast the vaccine can come to the market, but I had underestimated the um, difficulty of producing billions of vaccines in no time. That has never been done. It's not to blame anybody. But also, when you look at it, the, the main players are not the big vaccine, traditional vaccine pharmaceutical companies, the JSKs, the Merck, the Sanofi, Pfizer, yes. Um, so that's a big issue. Now, COVAX uh, is starting to work. It uh, took a while, but over 28 million vaccines have been uh, shipped to various countries, particularly in Africa. So uh, it's a beginning, and the priority groups there are healthcare workers, frontline workers. Next slide. Now, will vaccination work? A big question. First, will they work against new variants? And I'll say a few words about that. How long will they protect? We don't know, um, and uh, uh, personally, I think it's probably 
more than for one year and so on, but we may need some boost at some point. Are they safe? Uh, see the huge uh, debate at the moment, several European countries, and today even Germany has said that they stop, um, uh, you know, giving the AstraZeneca uh, Oxford vaccine because there were cases of thromboembolic uh, events, including in young women. Um, the European Medicines Agency and the FDA and HMRC have said that there's no evidence that this is caused by, um, by the vaccine, but these cases are now being investigated. But um, uh, you can imagine that uh, it's creating a lot of panic there. Will there be enough vaccines? And the answer is no at the moment. Huge, huge supply problem in the world. Manufacturing is the big issue. Who will get them first? The big debates and uh, even corruption, those in power some, in some countries. And will people accept them? Um, less of a problem in the UK, but in some countries, uh, take France, for example, but also in the US, where 30 to 50% of people just don't uh, uh, show up or don't want a vaccine. And this is being um, uh, looked at by the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School. Um, and, uh, and it's a big, big issue. Uh, and, and fueled by social media and a lot of uh, conspiracy theories and fake news, but also people who ask legitimate questions. How is it that a vaccine can be developed so fast? How do we know it's safe, etc.? And I think these people, we should really uh, be very open and, and, and discuss and give information. With the, the hardcore anti-vaxxers, that's a different story. Next slide, please. Um, now, Human coronaviruses uh, were already identified in the mid 60s, and we know them, some of one of them here in, the, in England. Uh, they're just a, a common cold type of, uh, uh, of uh, viruses. But then in the recent years, we had MERS, we had SARS first, and then MERS, and now SARS CoV 2. Uh, the next slide. So there's, a, there's probably the many, many more in, in nature. We know that from veterinary medicine. I have the next slide. Um, and now the, the latest uh, something that no virologist was uh, surprised by are so-called uh, variants, mutations. So viruses, that's what they do. Certainly RNA viruses, they mutate, they recombine, combine. And uh, uh, next slide. And the first one that was a virus, a, a variant of concern, as it's called formally, was discovered in the UK, in Kent. Um, and um, it's been shown um, that not only is it more transmissible, but between 30 and 70 percent, more or less. This is from a paper that came out in Science last week, by also by Nick Davis and colleagues from the London School. And then also another paper showing that uh, there's also increased mortality, um, you know, by this virus. And that partly explains why we had such a uh, massive epidemic at the beginning of the year, um, partly because people were not following the rules, but also, um, or what, or the, the rules were too lax, but also because of this new variant, which is much harder to bring under control. However, the current situation in the UK has shown that with our measures of lockdown and uh, social distancing and all that, we can bring under control such variants as well. Next slide. Uh, a big concern is, um, that some of these variants and there have been now there's more and more sequencing and the reason one of the reasons that we found them first in the uk is that uk has uh, you know together with a few countries like denmark and singapore is doing more sequencing than anywhere else in the world half of all uh, sequence uh, viruses of sars cov2 in the world come from the uk not because we have half of the number of cases but because there is a uh, fantastic sequencing um, program here but in the in in south africa there is a variant that uh, was shown in the lab to not interact with uh, if in uh, to the same degree with uh, monoclonal antibodies that are being used uh, uh, or tested for treatment but also with vaccines and here you see i won't go into details but the astrazeneca oxford vaccine um, highly effective in uh, overall efficacy and uh, and it works quite well against the B117, the UK variant. However, in a relatively small trial in South Africa against uh, the B1351 um, uh, variant, 
it showed only a 10% efficacy. In other words, it didn't work. Um, but there were no uh, severe cases. So we don't know whether the vaccine protects against severe cases. Novavax, a vaccine that's not yet approved, but is very promising and showed very uh, high uh, effectiveness in trials, uh, close to 90%, um, and including against the uh, B117 variant uh, in 85%. Uh, but it went down the efficacy uh, to um, about 50% in, in South Africa. The j, &J vaccine, which has been approved in the US and in the EU, um, had a, is, uh, a, an efficacy of uh, overall of along the same lines as the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. It's using the same platform of a corona, of an adenoviruses. That, uh, you know, um, showed um, encouraging effectiveness against the South African variant and um, with 88%, 89% um, protection against severe disease. In their clinical trial, they had lots of severe uh, diseases and mortality, so that was good. Although the uh, effectiveness against a mild infection also went down. Next slide. So, and there are, there are concerns. Um, like um, in Brazil, there is a, a variant called P1, um, and uh, which seems to be was discovered in the, in Japan, but this uh, uh, was particularly uh, dominant in the in the, the Amazon, uh, in the Manaus, and now in the spreading over uh, Latin America, and uh, is giving rise to reinfections. People who have been infected with a classic variant um, became infected. So no. Um, or not enough uh, protective immunity, natural immunity. We don't know really how that is going to work against uh, for the current vaccines. So what we need really is a, whatever you call it, a universal coronavirus vaccine, a variant proof, just as we need a universal influenza vaccine. But the good news is the current vaccines are effective against severe disease and death of the variants at least that are circulating here. Uh, next slide, I'm coming to the towards the end. So the future of the pandemic will vary by country um, because not everybody, every country is at the same stage or applying the same measures to the same extent and that is accepted. So the first one is factor is societal and public health responses. And I mentioned what's the difference between the Eastern and Southeast Asia and, uh, and Europe um, or the West vaccine coverage. We, we don't know really, is it probably, everybody says 70%, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see, is it uh, with these variants that are more transmissible, it may be higher than the vaccine coverage that's needed to reach some kind of herd immunity. The duration of natural and vaccine-induced immunity, it looks like vaccine-induced immunity may actually be more effective and longer duration than the natural, effect, but we don't know. Um, seasonality uh, is a factor, uh, uh, probably and uh, future mutations of the virus we don't know so it looks like um, this way become an endemic uh, virus um, just as HIV has become uh, endemic and other infections next slide which doesn't mean that it's a disaster uh, and what we could have and, uh, is different scenarios with um, every winter a, an outbreak or every other winter or when a new variant comes up and so on. So next slide, please. Um, but vaccination can really uh, make a huge impact. There's been a big, uh, uh, you know, call that some, uh, like the Barrington Declaration and so on for that we should go to herd immunity. I think it is probably um, very premature to count on that, uh, besides the fact that that would cause millions more of deaths. Um, but at the current pace of vaccination, uh, and uh, the vaccines are not 100%, not everybody has it, um, variants come and go. Uh, so uh, we, we may not reach that herd immunity uh, very soon. Next slide. And so I would expect that by the winter, we will have another uh, wave, but um, most probably and hopefully not as bad as what we are going through now. There's another a movement now of zero COVID. Um, and uh, first of all, I should re remind people that there's only one virus that infects humans that have been er er eradicated, that's zero, and it is smallpox. And it took a long time, 
polio, we have been closed for the last 20 years and we are still not there. Um, so uh, I think that um, the zero COVID is nice. That would be great, but it's not something that we can uh, go for at the moment. Um, also, um, of course, we're an island, so you could lock up the island and then uh, like New Zealand. The problem is that now, uh, when do you reopen? Because the whole, uh, do we have to wait until the whole world is vaccinated? Um, it will be really, really um, not very uh, practical. The, the cost, it would be enormous. Um, therefore, I think we need to go to systems of uh, societies living with COVID. Um, and uh, we'll need uh, things like uh, COVID vaccine certificates and passports and so on to um, uh, not necessarily to have access like in Israel, no, to go to the cinema or to go to the gym, but certainly for international travel. Can I have the next slide? I think is the last one. So the time uh, is really to prepare now. Well, the vaccine deployment uh, will continue. And, and, uh, and that will require that we also will vaccine, have to vaccinate children, but no vaccine has been approved for children, but the, the trials are going on because even if they're less affected and, and getting ill, but they can continue to be a source. Um, but we need to continue the, um, the uh, you know, all the measures. Um, although in the United States, the uh, American Centers for Disease Control have just issued a statement last week that people who are fully vaccinated in the US can um, meet with other people, uh, one other ho household without a mask in, 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 inside. It's um, the evidence that the vaccination is not blocking transmission and, and uh, is not yet there, but everything goes into the, in the, in the right direction, I would say. So we'll have to continue and uh, not just uh, count on vaccination, but it will be a whole package that we'll, uh, that we'll have to respect. Next slide. Um, so that's where this, uh, you know, the UK government has um, issued a roadmap out of lockdown and quite a few countries are doing it. Um, but uh, uh, they, these plans often have to be adapted in function of the, um, you know, of the emergence of new variants and new facts. Uh, we're uh, we're really not yet out of the um, of the problems. Next slide. So to end, um, of course, there will be lots of uh, reviews and all that, and thinking what went well, what did, what went wrong, and so on. But the first thing is that, uh, as is the title, this is a small ad here of my memoir. It's no time to lose. When you deal with epidemics, you the sooner you act, the more uh, the bigger your impact is. Um, because it's contagious. If you can limit uh, the number of infections in the beginning, you, you're going to limit all the, the ones that would have been infected out of that. However, that's, that's the theory. In practice, it's very difficult because then as a society, as a politician, as a decision maker, you need to take draconian measures before there is a problem. Very, very difficult to do, certainly in democracies. So that's where this leadership is important, but it is I, I, I have sympathy for the leadership that it's, this is not easy, it's certainly in the beginning. Now we know basically well, and certainly don't wait until mortality is going up or people in intensive care units, because that means that, you know, that, that's a month after the surge in, in new infections. Um, science has offered many tools and that's a really um, fantastic. And if we have these vaccines, it's not because messenger RNA technology or the adenovirus platforms were just discovered uh, a year ago. Now, this is the result of decades of investment and of work. And without that, we wouldn't have these vaccines. But let's not fool ourselves. There are no magic bullets. We'll have to continue to have a combination of these measures. We need to invest much more in public health systems and be prepared for the next pandemic. Um, and. Uh, uh, and that means that, uh, you know, it's, it's investing in things that hopefully we will never need, but to, for early warning, for uh, societal preparedness and involve people. You know, the communities, uh, I think one of the reasons also that the vaccine deployment is so successful is that uh, primary care has been involved, uh, 
uh, the GPs, um, the communities, uh, much more than with the uh, overall response. Uh, I'll stop here and uh, apologies for having spoken a bit too long. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. That's a fantastic uh, lecture. And I'll just give a, another plug for your book, No Time to Lose, which I was reading this afternoon in preparation for this uh, lecture. It's beautifully written and uh, a whole lot more information in there for those of you who want to download a copy onto your, uh, your iPad. Now, there are quite a few questions, Peter. We haven't got time for too many, but Matthew O'Brien says, uh, thank you, Prof Piot. In the UK, we've nearly vaccinated uh, all of the most vulnerable uh, to severe disease and death, about 40% of the population. Would you advocate pausing our vaccination uh, program and diverting to countries most in need? At, uh, what, is, what would you say to that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a, it's a question that's very close to my heart, uh, having worked a lot of my life and uh, uh, particularly in Africa. And uh, at some point, I think uh, we'll need to do that. Um, of course, the responsibility of um, every government is towards your own citizens. But I think uh, here, um, what we will soon see, and we're already starting to see, is a real a collapse of mortality uh, in, among those age groups that have been vaccinated. And I think it's time to start sharing that. The Prime Minister has announced it. Uh, but without giving a, a date on it, uh, uh, also in the EU and President Biden. But uh, I, I think the UK, because we are so advanced with the vaccination that uh, one should consider um, yeah, sharing that. And, and frankly, at the moment, anything that bans of exports and so on from uh, wherever country is, that's not going to help the world. We need to have um, to, to start sharing that um you know and it's it's frankly it's also in our own interest yeah yeah no we're not safe until we're all safe quite right well um one more question from me which is you you mentioned you think there will be a third wave here in the autumn I, it, what are what are the chances of that we're all kind of dreading another lockdown our prime minister promised that this one was going to be irreversible but uh, i think that was a rather rash promise well, I mean, I'm just relying on um, the the work of uh, various models, and uh, um, I I think with the the way that the vaccination rollout is going, I don't expect that there would be a need for a, um, a lockdown. Um, I think we may be faced more with uh, what we we're used to in so-called normal times in terms of an uh, influenza epidemic uh, or outbreak in the in the winter, uh, and by the way. Uh, the fact that we, we've had hardly any case of uh, influenza this winter is thanks to all the measures, you know, social distancing. So, but on the downside is that um, we'll, uh, at least in a year or two, uh, hardly anybody will have any immunity or partial immunity against influenza. So we will maybe be faced with influenza epidemics, but we can vaccinate against that. So I think that... Um, I don't expect, uh, okay, and uh, it's very risky, you know, to make this kind of <laughs> but that we would uh, um, have a massive uh, outbreak as we have now. But um, there will be further waves, uh, undoubtedly. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I think we better hand uh, over in a minute to Sir David Jeffcott, who's... Uh, uh, grandfather Sir Harry set up these things. Just just before I do, Sir David, I uh, just wanted to mention that um, uh, we've got a, a climate change, uh, the health hazards, uh, emergent, health emergency of climate change start series starting tomorrow at six o'clock on uh, the RSM. And then on Wednesday, uh, the pre previous Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, is talking in, on, in conversation. So do tune into those. Um, so David, uh, would you like to just to give a vote of thanks to our really excellent lecturer, Peter Piot, who is soon to be an honorary fellow of uh, the Royal Society of Medicine. Thank you, David. Thank you, Professor Kirby, Professor Piot, and also to members of the audience, of course. Firstly, as uh, Sir Harry's eldest grandson, may I thank the RSM for still managing to host the 42nd edition of the Jeff Gott Lecture, and on a very topical subject under very difficult circumstances. A couple of, uh, well, an interesting factor 
today is an anniversary. It's the 18th anniversary of the World, World, World Health Organization announcing a health alert for a new respiratory disease, SARS. Anyhow, I thought I would recount one of my grandfather's, uh, one of his achievements. Okay. He was working with the British and American governments to stem a bacterial infection that was blighting the medical world in the late 1930s and early 40s, and was particularly affecting the wounded soldiers. They knew the answer lay in this wonder drug. We now know it as penicillin, but they couldn't produce enough of it or of enough, uh, uh, sufficient purity. In 1941, my grandfather was shown the answer to by an American company, Pfizer. I seem to have heard that somewhere else using an industrial process called deep vat fermentation. All the way home in an RAF bomber, he was figuring out a quick way to replicate the process for the benefit of the British war effort. Upon landing, he went straight to his office in Greenford and immediately leased two beer brewing vats from the local brewery. And from this very basic production unit, over 80% of penicillin was produced over the next six months until a more uh, commercial plant could be commissioned. That was the foundations of his chairmanship of the Glaxo Group, or GSK as we now know it, and thus enabling us to enjoy lectures like this one and furthering our knowledge. Now, may I personally, on behalf of the family, the audience and the RSM, thank you, Professor Peart, for your enthralling insight into pandemics, and in particular, the one that we are experiencing now. Professor Peart, thank you very much. Now, applause with Zoom doesn't really work, so I don't quite know what we do now. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think it's my, there are a few more questions, but actually I think we better let Peter go. It's such a fantastic talk. Those slides are so clear. I mean, I, I think that uh, he mentioned the problem of anti-vax and the uh, reluctance uh, to, for people to get vaccinated. And I think clear communication of scientists like Peter uh, are the answer, because unfortunately there is an awful lot of, of uh, very bad information circulating on, so, on social media. Uh, I'm not sure what's to be done about that. But that was an absolutely fantastic talk, the age of uh, pandemics. I think we'll let you go off now and have a nice supper Peter, and we'll see you on the 27th of July for uh, uh, the where you're going to receive your honorary fellowship. It's a year delayed by this uh, little virus that's been causing so much trouble, but we'll see you at the Royal Society of Medicine. And people do come along to that uh, in the audience. Hopefully by then we'll be able to mix, uh, perhaps socially distanced, but we'll be mixing and uh, you'll be able to meet Peter in person there. Thank you, Sir Harry. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Victor, for organizing the AAV. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. <laughs>